All right, guys, we come across uh, some curly dock here. Uh, if y'all remember back a few segments on the Meat Trapper uh, radio, we, uh, we made crackers from the, uh, from the seeds. From the seeds stock. All right, fellas, Meat Trapper here, and I have got a treat for you today. We are out here in uh, western Tennessee, and I am here with Mr. Clint Thomas, and Clint is an expert on wild edibles and foraging. Now we're out here and he has never been here before so we are cold rolling in this territory and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start walking through the woods and he is gonna school me on how to forage and how to identify wild edibles. And I know I'm gonna learn a lot and I think you will too. So Clint, how long have you been into uh, foraging for wild edibles and, and how did you get started? Um, I've always been interested in, in the outdoors as, as a little kid, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the boys are. Um, whenever I was a little kid, I remember watching a, a TV show, uh, it's called uh, Kung Fu, The Legend Continues, and I remember watching a Shaolin monk eat a, uh, a rose petal off of a, a rose plant. Yeah. And uh, that really intrigued me about, about the outdoors, and uh, another time I remember watching uh, a family member of mine harvesting pine needles, making pine needle tea. Right. And that's what really kind of got the ball rolling. And then, uh, anyway, I met met an Indian lady there in Oklahoma by the name of Jackie Dill, my mentor. Yeah. And she she was taught by her grandmother, who was a Cherokee medicine woman. Right. And it, it was just passed down from generation to generation, and, and she, she passed that knowledge along to, to me, my uh, brother and sister. Right. Uh, and just went on from went there. On from there. Um, I've, I've been foraging and, and wild crafting for, for several years now. Yeah. Um, I try to put it in practice in, in my everyday life whenever I can, but working and living on the road sometimes it makes it pretty hard, you yeah. know. But uh, Well, I tell you, I have certainly learned a lot from you already. Now, if, uh, if you are all on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash meat trapper and get signed up. And if you're listening to Meat Trapper Radio, Clint has done multiple segments on gathering and foraging and preparing wild edibles. And we're not just talking about eating leaves like a rabbit. We're talking about producing good, healthy meals for your family. And so I've already learned a lot. Uh, you, you, there's a lot of material that he's already done. So let's go ahead and get started. You ready to go? Yes, sir. Sure. All right. Let's do it. Okay. And what is this, Clint? This is a wild violet. Um, whenever it's flowering, you know, it'll have a blue to purple flower on it. Um, wild violets are usually just used as, as a salad green. Okay. Um, the flowers you can use to make uh, hard candy, uh, syrup, and uh, jellies with. Okay. So basically, uh, when we're coming through here and we see this, and it's, just, it's characterized by that heart-shaped flower with that deep V in it, I could just pick that right there, put that in my pack, and uh, that's going to be in my salad tonight, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. What we found here is uh, some day flowers. And how you use these, you just cut them up into inch and a half inch pieces, throw it in the stir fry, uh, braise it, saute it. Really good stuff. Now the identifying feature on that would be the blue flowers and then the uh, elongated leaves. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, and it looks kind of like, I don't know, bamboo shoots, I guess. Okay. But, uh, yeah, the, the pods the, the pods that the flowers grow out of, they open up kind of like Venus flytraps. Oh, yeah. Okay. Look at that. Interesting. All right. Good to know. And that's a day flower. Day flower, yes, sir. All right. All right, here's the day flower that we, we just found, and a similar plant. You notice how the uh, the leaves are attached to each, each plant. This one has a sheath that kind of goes around the stem. And with this one, there's little tiny fuzzy hairs where the leaf, where the leaf is, is attached to the stem. Not sure what this is, whether it's a poisonous look-alike or just one that is similar. But uh, you definitely want to be able to identify the two and distinguish to a part. You gotta be certain. That's right. Because uh, I don't mind admitting I'm the one that picked uh, this one here and uh, and thought it was a day flower and he said nope wrong and that's just because uh, you gotta know what you're doing you gotta look at the tiny details so 
good deal. All right, and this is, uh, what did you say, Clint? Horse chestnut? Horse, horse chestnut, yes, sir. Interesting. This uh, We found a tree here, and it's just loaded with these. Um, they kind of sort of look like a, a hickory nut, but um, but it's not. It's got uh, It's got these bumps all over the outside of it. And when you cut it open, in this stage, this is what it looks like. And uh, what did you say? It's uh, uh, poisonous, mildly toxic, or what? Yes, it's uh, moderately poisonous, and the toxin is destroyed by uh, roasting or boiling. Hmm. Um, it's used to reduce swelling, in skin, uh, increase skin tissue, uh, increase the circulation, and it encourages flexibility. Interesting. But yeah. with it being... Uh, uh, moderately poisonous. You definitely want to be careful. With be this careful. One. That's a that's a new one to me. I uh, I did did not know that. All right, guys. We come across uh, some curly dock here. Uh, Y'all remember back a few segments on the uh, meat trapper uh, radio? We uh, we made crackers from the uh, from the seeds. From the seeds stock. Um, this one here is a little past its prime. But just so you kind of get a look at uh, the color of yeah, the... Yeah, because it is August, you know. This right. We're not doing this in prime time. This is this is August. But now, And so this is the leaves down here, right? Right, these are the leaves. Um, this one right here, you could probably eat right off the plant. These two here. Yeah. You know, nice young tender ones. This one here would be a little bit tough. But uh, this is the plant that we was talking about making the uh, cream of dock soup. Yep. And I, I've eaten the leaves just straight picking them off the ground and, and eating them as I go. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good stuff that way. And so then when it uh, when it matures, and this is a seed pod, you'd gather the seeds and then you grind them up into flour, and uh, make your make your crackers or what have you out of that. Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Awesome, great. You see, we've got a bunch of it back here now. How do we how do we harvest those seeds and and prepare them? To, to harvest the seeds, you just take it like that and it just they strip off real easy gotcha and you take them home put them in a mortar and pestle crush them up grind them up you know put them in a food processor um, add your flour and other ingredients that we talked about on MTR on, and yeah, uh, on the podcast and uh, and so that's easy you just come along and just just strip them like that and then put them in a baggie yep. and off you go yep. outstanding man All right. All right, fellas, what we found here, this is known as uh, bee balm or bergamot. Um, it's used for uh, lung issues, uh, coughing and uh, that kind of stuff, and it's also used as an insect repellent. But uh, if you break up the, the leaves here and get those oils going, man, does it smell like lemon. It does. It, it really does. I was shocked at how pungent and odor just one single leaf has when you when you crush it up like that now this this is not what it looks like when it's flowering this is like I say we're in August here and it's past prime but uh I can I can only imagine a tea made out of that that would be really really good yeah yeah also used as a uh, insect repellent but uh, whenever it is past its prime you can see these uh, three little flower tufts right here yeah and that's, you know, they don't always have three. Sometimes they have two. And sometimes there's just the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see taking those leaves and crushing it and rubbing it on your skin. I can, I can definitely see that as being an insect repellent, man. Yeah. I tell you, I'm learning, I'm learning a lot. I would have walked right past that. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, guys, here we got uh, some carpet weed. Um, every part of this plant is edible. This plant is high in nitric oxide, which lowers blood pressure. Um, it's good for bodybuilding, wow. uh, building muscle tissue, and uh, for us men, that, uh, that's good for uh, sexual power, you know? Well, that plant is mine. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it all you want. <laughs> no, that's crazy. I mean, just right out here, you can see we're just out on an open field. Uh, walking along and he spotted it and uh, you know one of the interesting things is is uh, I actually take some supplements that have nitric oxide in it that opens uh, the vascular system and uh, it allows you to to more readily absorb other supplements and uh, so instead of paying for it here is a here's a natural variety right here fascinating man cool good deal man 
All right, fellas. This right here, a lot of y'all might be familiar with. This is uh, wood sorrel. Um, you can tell by the heart-shaped leaves. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of a trail snack for most people. It has a real tangy, lemony flavor. It really does. I was shocked at, at how pungent and potent that lemon flavor is when I tried that. Really, really good. Um, really good. Just walk along and pick it and, uh, yeah, the and eat it. The flowers are edible. This would probably be real good in, in just a side salad dish. Yeah. Great. Great. Man, really good stuff. I was shocked at that. Thing that I have a question, Clint, is uh, to me the wood sorrel looks a lot like regular clover. How do you how do you tell that apart? Um, for one, the, the leaves are heart shaped on wood sorrel. I uh, gotcha. Clover is, is it's more of an oval or oblong shaped leaf. Gotcha. And on on the top part of the leaf, there's kind of a, a white halo. Gotcha. Ring to look for. Yep. And clover is edible too. I mean, you see deer eating that stuff all the time. Yeah, but it doesn't taste as good as this stuff. I can promise you that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, not all plants are edible and uh, and good for you. And so, what do we have here, Clint? This is a uh, pokeweed. Um, a lot of people back home in Oklahoma, you see how dark these berries can be. They, they call this inkberry plant. Okay. Um, I guess you could use those berries as uh, as an ink or type of dye. Um, this, this is a toxic plant, poisonous plant, but it's still edible. Uh, the part that you want to use for, for eating are the leaves. And the way you make these edible is, is that you, you know, pack a, a, a pot with the leaves and you boil it in water. Okay. And uh, you have to boil it in anywhere from three to five changes of, of clean water. And clean, change the water out and get the toxins out. Right. And then so, you can eat it. So once it's boiled the first time... Drained it off, you know, get as much of the liquid out of it, clean change of water, yep. boil it again, and just do that repeatedly, like I said, up to five times to get all the toxins out. Um, a lot of people in Oklahoma survived off this plant during the uh, Great Depression Dust wow. Bowl era. I mean, this stuff just goes everywhere down there. Uh, yeah. On my dad's farm, this stuff, it just it grows right next to mesquite trees everywhere. So you had to really be hungry to, to go through that much work for the greens then. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's good to know. That's going to be on my uh, last uh, last resort list there. But uh, good to know. Yeah, Thank and, and it's, it's real easy to identify because of the dark, dark black berries and, and the yep. red stems. Yep. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, fellas. This here, me and Tim, we was just walking down the creek here in western Tennessee. And this is watercress. And this is a superfood. This is packed full of vitamins and minerals, and basically all of them. Yeah. Um, this is part of the mustard family. It has a very strong mustard flavor. Um, as far as using it as a food, I'd say just as a uh, salad grain. I'm sure you could probably steam it, and make it come into like a spinach. But, uh, you know, this, this stuff, it always grows right next to water, if not in the water. And it has a very distinct mustardy flavor. You can really, it's, it's very potent as far as flavor. Excellent, excellent plant. And uh, I was just uh, reading in the guidebook um, every, all of the uh, vitamins and minerals that it has, and it truly is uh, a superfood. It truly is amazing. And it's just uh, growing here for free. All right, let's, uh, let's head on down the creek. Yes, sir. All right, guys, we just come across another wild plant out here in the creek. Um, some of y'all are thinking, I know that. It's a cattail, right? Well, you're wrong. This is an iris. And every member of the iris family is toxic. Of course, they don't have the most notable wild corn dog looking thing coming up out of, uh, out of a cattail. Right. So if you're going to harvest cattails, you always make sure and double check Make sure it's not an iris. Right. And, and the way that you tell is how the leaves come together when they're going down in the soil and water. Look at that. Interesting. But uh, we're going to try to find some cattails here before long. I'll show you and, the difference. Uh, show, show you the difference in the, in the root system and different parts that you can harvest and, and use for in the cattails. Alrighty. Good deal, man.
guys, another great wild level plant here. This is a Jerusalem artichoke or a sunchoke. Um, they're, they're not related to an artichoke at all. They're more closely related to sunflower. Um, they grow tubers in the ground like potatoes. Um, some can be relatively large, others smaller. Uh, smaller. They can have a, a nutty flavor to a milder flavor. Um, the thing to remember about Jerusalem artichokes, they contain a chemical called inulin. And you want to wait to harvest your, your tubers after a good hard freeze. Um, that kind of gets rid of some of the inulin. Um, and you don't really want to eat these raw. You can, but uh, the inulin is real bad about giving people gas and, and stomach upset. Hmm. So definitely want to cook them. Um, you can fry them up like fried potatoes. Okay. Roast them. Uh, you can even mash them up like mashed potatoes. Uh, you know, season them with all your favorite uh, spices, herbs. Yep, you got a nice, uh, nice patch of them here. Yes, yeah, Make, makes a good side dish. Awesome, awesome, good deal. We found us another useful plant. Not really an edible, but it's it's definitely a, a medicinal plant, and one for other uses for uh, gathering food. Uh, this is the mullein. Uh, better known as com com common mullein. This one's a little past its prime. Again, we're in, we're in August. Um, the leaves are usually a lot bigger than this, and they're very soft. It's also known as uh, nature's toilet paper, cowboy's toilet paper. Um, a lot of people on uh, Telegram has mentioned, you know, smoking the, the dried leaves for lung issues. Um, I don't recommend it because mullein is extremely harsh. Um, you can dry the leaves and make a tea out of it. Um, this stalk here, the seed stalk, in the spring will have bright yellow flowers on it. And if you want to use this for, for, for lung issues, you can take the, the, the yellow leaves, put them in a jar, and cover them with, with honey or sugar, and it'll, it'll break down the, the tissues of the flower and extract all the uh, good stuff for, for, for lung ailments. And it works just like mucinex. Hmm. You know, it gets rid of the phlegm and mucus in your lungs, you know, whenever you're sick. Another great use, of course, is the seeds. You can uh, break the seeds open using mortar, pestle, or food processor. And uh, the seeds contain uh, saponins. And, and what that does is it's a fish stunner. You know, it's going to take a lot of seeds. But you look at how big this Yeah, this, look at this that seed is. head, yeah. And, you know, I bet this, this one plant right here would probably have over 100,000 seeds in it, if wow. not more. So you take those seeds, strip them off, and uh, pound them up and pulverize them or whatever. Right. Put that in the uh, in the body of water to uh, stun the fish. So right. that just, you can, just a slow moving stream or like yep. a small pond, you know, fast moving, it'll just move it Dissipate. out too quickly. Yeah. You know, like, like a part of this creek behind you, Tim, you know, I mean, part of that would, would be just fine. But other parts of it, the water's just moving too fast. Yeah. So it'll just push it in and push and it out. And you can see all around, I mean, we're standing in a whole pile of them right here. All, all the way around. Uh, it's not just this one plant. They're, uh, they're all over. Yeah, so, and, uh, multiple uses. So, you can use that as toilet paper. You can use it as a, as a lung cleansative. Uh, make your cough syrup and also your fish stunner. So, that's a very, very useful plant and, to know. And this long stalk, whenever it, it's completely dried and, and dead in, in, the, in the winter time, um, in the center of it, it has a, a pith, uh, kind of like a punk that you get whenever you buy fireworks yeah that really takes a spark and will sit there and smolder and it's really good wow. uh, tender for, for making fire. excellent tender yeah a very very useful plant awesome good deal all right tribe we found some more uh, some more wild goodies here this is a wild carrot also known as queen anne's lace um, the identifying factors on this flower is the dark black spot in the middle of the flower and this lacy green leaflets underneath the flower. Um, this is a plant that can easily be confused with uh, hemlock. and uh, poison, poison hemlock, poison right? Poison hemlock, yes. And uh, you don't want to get, get these mixed up. Uh, this is in the later stages of going to seed. It'll, it'll kind of cup up and make like a, a little bird's nest inside there. Right there. Yep. Um, this is a, it's it's wild edible. 
you can actually eat the the, uh, the root like a regular carrot. However, it's it's not orange. Uh, it's a little bit more woody. Okay. Um, but uh, little known fact about Queen Anne's lace it was actually used as a form of birth control. Really? For the, for uh, Native American Indians. I can't remember if it was the seeds that they used yeah. or the roots, but there have been studies on it, and it's it's actually an effective. Uh, uh, form of birth control. And it's all out in here. We're just on the side of the road. You can see there's the highway there and uh, it is it is just everywhere out here. Not just a pretty flower. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff to know. Yep. Y'all might know what this is. For those of y'all that don't, this is a staghorn sumac. Uh, I'm sure a lot of y'all have read on, on online forums about bushcraft bush crafters making uh, some kind of lemonade or, or drink out of this stuff. I personally don't use it for, for that. I just don't like it whenever it's mixed in, in, in liquid as a tea or lemonade. What I do is dry this stuff out and use it as a seasoning. It has a tart, lemony flavor. It's excellent on fish um, and, and chicken. And it's, it's also good for a seasoning on another wild edible. And uh, me and Tim, we're on the lookout for it right now. But uh, just remember this, because we're, we're going to try to find some uh, a wild edible that's called Cossack asparagus. And uh, we find we find what we're looking for. We'll definitely show y'all. Sounds good, man. All right, what we're looking at here is a hog trail. It's a hog and a deer trail, and I've got this set up for hogs here. And we've just been having an off-camera discussion, but I'm going to review basically what we what we did. The first thing is, is I'm looking for a place on the trail where there is a tree close enough to the side of the trail that I can have my support wire reaching out, and I can also anchor the snare to good and high. And so this right here fits the bill. You can see there's some blocking there, blocking there. That's natural blocking. I didn't add anything. My snare is right here in the center of that trail. So let's take a closer look. What I'm using here is a 1 8 inch 7 by 7 cable snare with a cam lock, heavy duty snare. The snare is terminated with a uh, number 12 double barrel swivel right there. You can see that swivel. Then I have an extension cable that's also 7 by 7 1 8 inch cable. And you can see that is anchored off good and high. This is a uh, probably six and a half feet, maybe six feet, six inches. Now you can see I've just twisted it, just run it through the swivel right there. This is not going to support any swiveling action. That is where your swivel action is going to be going to be happening. Now you can see I have my support wire here. This is 11 gauge support wire. You can use 9 gauge, 14 gauge, or 11 gauge. For me, this is too far of a reach for 14 gauge. 14 gauge is going to be too floppy. You can use a 9 gauge which will work great but 9 gauge is so stiff it can be hard to work with with pliers in the woods. And so I've got my 11 gauge wire sticking out and it just terminates in the support collar right there. This took, uh, what do you say Clint, two minutes maybe? Yeah, two, two and a half. Two yeah, two and a half minutes to set up and that's with me flapping my gums. Now the reason that I anchor high is once that snare comes through, the hog comes through and he gets caught in the snare, when he goes, he's not going to get a perpendicular pull. He's going to be pulling at an angle. So he's not going to get full power to try and pop that cable. The next thing is, is you'll notice I selected a tree that is sturdy enough to hold the hog, but also has some give to it. This functions as a shock absorber or basically a built-in shock spring so that he can't pop the cable. Now this loop, this is where you're going to have to play with it, but you can see my knee is a little bit higher than center. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look at the size of the hog tracks on the trail, or if they're rubbing trees, you can look at the rub marks on the trees to determine what size hogs that you're dealing with. Now let me step around to the other side here. And you can see they're, they're rooting all in this area. This is all just tore up. Um, I don't know if it'll show up on video, but 
I mean, they're just all in here. You know, they've torn torn the whole area up. But what they're doing is they're running through here, and maybe that will give you a better look at the setup right there. Very quick, very simple, very cheap, and very effective. All right, we're at the exact same spot here, and I've got this set up for deer. And what I've done is I've modified the set a little bit, and I've used a little bit different um, snare. So let's take a look at it. The first thing that you're going to notice is, once again, I have anchored high, okay? Why do I anchor high on a deer? Well, when that deer starts wrapping around and around and around and around and around uh, as, as he fights, when he ends up wrapping completely up against this tree, I want him to be suspended by his neck, okay? So anchor up high. It has nothing to do with shock absorber or anything. It's just if he starts to wrap around this tree, I want him, I want him to hang neck high, okay? So that when he gives out, he's, he's going to self-asphyxiate. I've got the same number 11 support wire coming out here. Now, I'm using a little bit different snare. I am using a 332nd inch diameter snare. And you can see just how long this is. And this goes over to, to the snare itself. The reason that I'm using such a long cable is when that deer hits that snare, I want him to take off like a bat out of hell. And I want him to run all the way down this trail 15 feet or so and then when that cable runs out it's going to snatch him off his feet and it's going to lock down super super hard and in other words it's going to constrict around his throat to an incredible degree if i had that snare just right there he would only have two or three feet to pull and get a tight cinch but if i give him 10 or 12 feet to run when he's going full out and he hits the end of that cable it's going to snatch the crap up out of him and cinch it down tight on his throat and he'll probably have about three minutes to live at that point and that's what I want I don't want him alive beating up the meat full of adrenaline and all that I want him choked down and down out of the way where he's not causing a commotion he's not causing uh, people to, to come investigate so the next thing that you'll notice is I've got a pole over it when a deer comes up he's got two choices he can go over this pole or he can go under the pole. Everything that animal does in nature is calorically driven. His decisions are driven by, is it gonna cost me more calories to jump over or is it gonna cost me more calories to go under? You answer that question. If you have to jump over something, you're gonna burn a lot more calories than if you can just duck under it and keep walking. So this duck stick is gonna make sure that he ducks under the pole into the noose. Now. One of the things that I was just discussing here was that one trick is I will take corn and I will dribble corn up and down the trail. What this does is this keeps that deer's head focused down here. So he's not looking up here at head level, he's not at waist level, whatever. I'm keeping his attention down here. Then when he gets to it, you can see that I've taken a little piece of a twig there and I've hung it inside the snare loop hanging down. That's called a chin up. So that when he gets to this critical juncture, instead of his eyes hitting that, he's gonna pick his head up and go through the opening right through there where it's nice and clear. He's gonna go under the pole and he's gonna go above the chin up. And that's just that's just suspended right there. That's not gonna interfere with the closing of the of the snare at all. Just like that. Once he's in, he hits it. Off he goes, and then he gets uh, snatched up, and that's it. Now let's say that I didn't make a catch. It takes about 10 or 15 seconds to unclip the snare, roll it up, stick it in your pack. Support wire can stay right here, down, out of the way. Just like that. From a distance, you can hardly see anything is there. Next time you want to come make this set, your support wire is already cut, it's already wired in, it's already tightened up. All you have to do is extend it, clip your snare on, and put it in. You can do it in 30 seconds. If anybody's walking through the woods, they would have to be a trapper, or more specifically a snareman, to number one, 
understand what that is and what's been going on here. If somebody is not um, familiar with snaring, they're going to have no idea what that is. And once that weathers and sets, um, sets up with a little rust on it and what have you, it's going to be virtually invisible. So, um, you know, just something to keep in mind there. All right, well, it's been a long day, and uh, I tell you, I have learned a tremendous amount from Clint. I, I, I really have. And the thing is, you know, it's not only that I've learned about this particular plant or that particular plant, but I've learned how to identify them and what the characteristics of, uh, of identification are and the different places to look and what to look for when it comes to identification. And Clint has given me this book. And I'm telling you, if you're interested in this, this is a wonderful book. It's called Free Food and Medicine, and it's by Mar Marcus Rothkranz. Uh, the book is just beautifully illustrated. The, the, it's organiza the organization is wonderful, and it's just a great, great guidebook. And I really appreciate you giving me this, Clint. Absolutely, um, no problem. It really, it's really given me some new insight. And uh, I just want you to know I've had a wonderful time today, and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with me yes, sir. and with everybody yeah. watching. Yeah, we sure made a day of it, that's for sure. Yeah, even though it was August and it was hot, it was fun. Right, absolutely. I had a blast. I appreciate you inviting me. In. No problem. Have me come down and do, shoot this video with you. And you know, when we got to the end of this uh, scene here, looking over to our uh, our right here, there was a huge find of uh, oyster mushrooms, and I'll put a picture of that up. So it was a great way to end the day. And uh, so I filled the dump pouch up with them right here, and they're going to get thrown in the skillet as soon as I get home. So anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.